Thank you. It is wonderful to be with you today. This is the first time I'm speaking at IT Nonstop, and it is an honor to be with you today. Uh, even though I live in Philadelphia in the United States, I am uh, ethnically Armenian. It's nice to see the Armenian Code Academy as one of the university and IT school sponsors. Uh, so that's exciting for me. Uh, I am one of the Postgres core team members and have been working with Postgres since 1996. Uh, obviously, I've been in IT back to the uh, late uh, 1980s, so I've seen a lot of changes uh, over my time. And in this talk, I wanted to give you a perspective of where I see the uh, data needs going for, uh, for IT and uh, basically computer uh, requirements. Uh, you know, as a, as somebody who's been in the industry so long, we, we assume that tomorrow is going to be just like yesterday, um, that effectively what you needed yesterday is the same as what you need tomorrow, and it just keeps going. Uh, but having been in the industry for so long, there have definitely been dramatic changes. Uh, and we've been, we've been talking about some of them. In fact, if I talk even in the introduction, they were talking about some of the new things that are coming in the industry. Uh, so in this talk, what I wanted to do was to talk about how data needs have changed over time uh, and how uh, specifically the industry has adjusted to those. Uh, Postgres being the, the project that I'm the most familiar with has, has been in an ideal position to adjust to those changes. And it's one of the reasons Postgres is continued to be so popular. Uh, so I'd like to share this presentation with you and then uh, answer your questions at the end. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, first, we're going to talk about uh, what are the data needs of the future. As I said before, uh, data needs are different today than they were certainly in the 80s and 90s and even in the early 2000s. Um, and how, uh, how, how, what are those new data needs and what can we expect going forward? Secondly, I'd talk, like to talk about uh, the database Postgres that I work on. Uh, and how it has adjusted uh, very uniquely to those new data needs uh, in a way that we never could have anticipated. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I, you know, when I started with Postgres in 1996, did I really think it was going to become what it is today? Certainly not. <laughs> I, I really uh, did not expect this. Uh, but uh, fortunately, we are in this position and uh, Postgres is very strong. And the third element I wanted to talk about is what if you can't store your data in Postgres? What options do you have uh, if you've got uh, data distributed across multiple data stores? Uh, because that is a very common re requirement that uh, many organizations are having to go through now. And we'll talk about some of the pluses and minuses of that because there are quite a number of minuses when you don't have all your data stored in one place. So let's talk about the past. Uh, I have been involved with uh, computers probably to the 1970s. Uh, so actually, when I started, uh, we didn't have access to computers. I remember we had a programmable calculator uh, in my middle school, and that was probably the first computer that I or, or computation device that I had access to on a regular basis. Uh, I had a programmable calculator in high school. Uh, we did have one uh, computer in my high school. Uh, so uh, you basically had to take turns uh, using this one uh, computer. Uh, prior to when I was involved, uh, there were punch cards. That actually predates me. Uh, I never actually used punch cards. I have used teletyped. I, I did that uh, once in the 70s. Uh, on a on a um, uh, data general computer, actually, and obviously, you know, we're talking incredibly limited workloads, uh, really back then. But uh, as you may or may not know, uh, when things really kind of took off was in the '80s and '90s in terms of computation for enterprises. Uh, when in the 1980s, the big way that computers were used were typically through, through something called dump terminals. Uh, there were uh, VT100, if you've heard of that, VT220. Uh, IBM had a line of dump terminals. 
Uh, and these dumb terminals would be connected typically via serial cable to a server. And you may have you may have you know dozens of these in an organization. And t typically you'd have a, a sea of desks and everyone would have these dumb terminals on their desk and they would have character mode applications uh, and they would be entering data, whether it was billing data or data about costs or time entry or, or work requirements or orders. Uh, it would all be done on these dumb terminals with, with, <clears throat> with you know, character mode kind of applications. You can still see character mode applications once in a while. I was in the Philadelphia airport last month coming back from a 30 day trip. <laughs> I walked by one of the, one of the check-in desks and I, I, you know, it was, it was a computer, it was a, 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 you know, a PC, but it, it was running a character mode application. Uh, in the 1990s, what you started to see where the dumb terminal kind of went away, <clears throat> the people were still using emulators for the dumb terminals on their PCs. So the serial cables typically would be gone. They would be using uh, Ethernet and TCP IP, but effectively the interface to the user would be the same. And, and then the late 90s, you had fat clients and thin clients. You started to get into GUIs, okay? Um, I know now almost everything we do is a GUI, but back then that was a new thing. Um, so then in the 2000s, things really started to accelerate in terms of data needs because all of a sudden your data was potentially coming in with a web browser that was the new way to do everything right you have web-based you have mostly you didn't necessarily have web-based applications like we do today but you have web forms that you would order things from so web store uh you know web orders was obviously there was a huge market there now all of a sudden you had data not necessarily coming in from dedicated character applications, but from these web uh, web application or web browser uh, forms that would be uh, submitting data. And then in the 2010s, you know, almost the wheels came off, right? So now all of a sudden, instead of just having web forms to order, you had web applications. And then you had mobile applications. So mobile phones had applications that were generating data. Then people wanted to have documents stored in the database so that you could integrate the orders with the documents that went with it or, or whatever. Uh, text communication. So they wanted to start capturing chat traffic into the database. Uh, geolocation data. So things like GPS devices on trucks uh, and ships uh, and planes were starting to get brought into databases. Internet of Things, so things like temperature data, uh, motion, uh, human motion data, uh, lights turning on and on, people checking in uh, with their smart cards or their their cat cards that they would use to get into buildings, uh, and sensor data. So all of a sudden, you can see the change over time going from effectively very limited, you know, teletype character mode data all the way to this much richer data that comes in, which has a much more structured format, which is much more sophisticated in terms of, of the type of data and what that data says. And of course, the volume of data is much greater. You, know, you can only type so quickly on a character mode terminal. Now you potentially could have thousands of apps, a millions of apps potentially, uh, hundreds of millions in, in certain countries generating data simultaneously that you have to capture. So that's a huge change in terms of what data came in, the volume of data, and the type of data over time. I think this illustrates it pretty clearly. In, in, the, in the 90s and 80s, you pretty much just had relational data. Everything came in, had a relational structure. The data came in very sort of predetermined uh, from the applications that you were using and it would be stored in a relational structure. You potentially had a data warehouse capability on the side. But now you have web browsers, you have mobile data, Internet of Things, documents, GPS, social media, all generating data and all generating data in different formats. And frankly, you have a, a concern of, um, is this data all really relational? Is it all something that makes sense in a relational structure? So 
obviously I'm a relational person, been doing relational since the, the late eighties. Um, and relational structures are great. Um, they are very flexible. You can see the data in a whole bunch of different ways. You can do different analytic capabilities with your data. Fantastic. However, uh, relational is not always the best way to store every piece of data. Uh, because in a lot of these cases, when you're looking at GPS data or uh, data from phone applications, or for example, JSON data that's coming in from maybe a phone app, uh, or geolocation data, or even documents, right? Um, storing that potentially in a relational structure, you can lose the original content by atomizing it into a relational structure. So you effectively imagine GPS data, you take the longitude and latitude maybe, and you store them separately. Well, you've lost some information there because now you've just stored what was a location when they were together becomes two separate numbers, which don't mean anything uh, to a relational system. Uh, and, and also there are limited indexing capabilities when you separate data and atomize it, as you typically have to do it in a relational structure, uh, you use indexing capabilities. Now, I, I have some talks on my website that get into that. Uh, but uh, let's talk about a different way of handling this okay so one of the one of the ways to store this new type of data is not necessarily to force all the data into a relational structure but in some cases to keep the the original structure intact so for example if you're digest in, in, in if you're loading json data into your application do you want to retain that data as json and if you do retain it as json does the data store understand the json enough in a way for you to efficiently index it into a way for you to efficiently manipulate it and return it to the user uh, yes you can just store json as a string and return it as a string you can store gis data as a string and return it as a string you can store full text search data as a string and return it as a string but is that making the full use of that data wouldn't it be nice if you had a data store that under not only could store this data but understood it and could manipulate it and could index it in a smart way and that's i think where we're seeing post relational heading where we're starting to see relational systems that are able to store data that's not necessarily relational, but meets today's data needs in an effective way. Uh, another case where you see a lot of this data atomization is in microservices. Uh, so you start to see, okay, this application needs to store GIS data. So that application is going to use a GIS data store. And then this other application for phone data needs JSON. So now I'm going to store it in the JSON data store. And this one has financial data. So I'm going to use relational here. And maybe I have Internet of Things and I need fast data digestion. I need some. So you can see that, that some of the solutions have, if you look in the past 10 years, some of the solutions have been to atomize data storage, uh, to, to use a data store that's specifically designed for your type of data that's coming in. The problem is that um, you lose the model as a data store, uh, but any, all, obviously integrating that data and data governance become much more difficult because now your data is kind of stored all over the place. It's hard to see how it's related. It's hard to make sure it's uniform. If somebody wants to remove a segment of data, how do you make sure you've gotten it all? Um, and how do you make sure that that data is, is sanity, sane, that it's uh, following the governance, data governance or policies of your organization. It becomes much, more, it does become much more difficult. So I, I and I, this is, I think, a great illustration of, of where I think the industry is going. And uh, fortunately, Postgres is kind of out head in front on this. Uh, in the top left, we have the traditional relational data. This is a case where you stored all your data in one big data store. Uh, but the data store may not know how to properly index and manipulate some of the new data types that you're bringing in. On the top right over here, uh, we have 
effectively the atom the the multiple data store solution the case where you've effectively got a json data store here maybe a gis data store somewhere else you have a data warehousing a different place and then maybe a relational third place at the bottom i think is the best of both worlds it's effectively a relational system that understands gis that understands json that can do data warehousing and also is a powerful relational system at the same time uh, having all of those things together uh, is incredibly useful because you eliminate a lot of the complexity of having separate data stores uh, but at the same time uh, your data store understands how to use all of the new data types that you're bringing in uh, i think this describes it a little a little differently um, and I've done a lot of work on microservices. I'll show you the, my URL at the end. I have a very long presentation about microservices on my website. Uh, but effectively, um, it, a lot of organizations are moving for microservices into agile teams where they can control their data, where they have specialized data stores for their type of data that that particular microservice team is working on. Uh, but the problem there is that although the team can work with the data very easily, it's very hard to integrate and govern that data outside of the team because it's a separate data store. Um, on the bottom is the same problem as well. In a monolithic system, uh, you have very good data integration and governance, but you may not have very good specialized data for your systems. Uh, the middle one, I think, is the most interesting where you can actually do microservices with understanding of the specialized data that you have plus it effectively sits in one large data store where you can have data integration and data governance and data analysis in a very in a very uniform way so as you may have alluded uh, or suggest, suspected from what i was talking about uh, postgres is effectively this relation plus data store uh, it really is the only database that allows you to do both uh, relational and non-relational effectively at the same time. It does have specialized data stores to fit your needs, but at the same time, it's a powerful relational system. And it allows you to uh, do all of the relational things that you've done before. A lot of people have rushed to the new data stores, rushed to the specialized data stores. Uh, but over time, uh, people have realized that they've lost a lot by, by throwing away or not having relational capabilities. Uh, so what I think Postgres has done and what I think has made Postgres very popular is the ability to do both the relational and the non-relational together. So why is this true well am i just making it up is it something i just want to make postgres look good um why why would uh why would postgres effectively be an ideal data store for today's data needs well the answer to this goes back to 10 years before i even started with postgres in 1986 yes the Postgres code base is that old. Uh, I think we're going on what? Uh, let's see, uh, 36 years uh, of code base. Now, the code base is very well maintained. It's f constantly updated, constantly restructured. So it actually is a really clean data uh, uh, code base, even though it is 36 years old. But what's really interesting that happened in 1986 is that Michael Stonebreaker, who you see pictured down here, uh, was working at the University of California at Berkeley. He was actually uh, the author of the Ingress database, which was one of the first relational systems in the 1970s. And in 1986, he decided he was going to make a post-relational system. What he, I think he called it object relational um, but what, what was really unique about what he, he did in 1986 was he said, okay, I understand what relational systems do today, but I don't think relational systems are going to be flexible enough for the data needs of tomorrow. Now, he was saying this 36 years ago, okay? <clears throat> and what he basically said was that relational databases need to be extendable. 
they need to be able to be modified easily for whatever data needs appear in the future. Because remember, back in 86 and even 2006, most relational systems were, you know, had a, had a numeric data type, had a string data type, had a time data type, had a couple other ones. But they didn't have flexibility. Okay. So he basically developed this relational database called Postgres in 1986. I started in 1996. This whole extendability thing was a headache for us. Okay. It was... It was something that we thought Michael we thought Michael Strobaker had an idea 10 years ago. He gave us this relational system. We were working on it as open source uh, enthusiasts at that time. But everything was abstracted. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. But it was really hard uh, to work at, in a code base where everything could be extended because everything was more complicated, right? And in fact, it took until... I want to say 15 years ago until we really even embraced this extendability in a major way. Because remember, as I said before in the history, think of 2000, 2005, uh, you were just the, you know, that web app thing was just getting started. You didn't have a lot of these sophisticated data types then. Uh, so Postgres was like, okay, yeah, it can do this extendability, but we really just want a relational system. What's happened in the past 15 years is that the industry requirements have changed so dramatically that the non-relational part of Postgres, the extendability part of Postgres is actually a major value of Postgres today. That was not true in 1996, and it probably even wasn't true in 2006. But today, that extendability capability is hugely important in allowing Postgres to handle the data needs of today. What specifically do I need by, mean by extendable? Well, here on the right, we have a chart of the Postgres system tables. And I realize it might be small. You can't see it very well. But for example, the blue area over here is actually for flexible indexing. Yes, Postgres has extendable indexing capability. Yes, we have B-tree, but we also have things like Brin. We have GIST. We have GIN. We have SPGIST. We have a whole bunch of different data indexing methods that are specially required for non-relational data, like JSON, full text search, and GIS. Okay, uh, we have data types which can be loaded into this table and can be extended just like the native data types. We have aggregates that can be added to Postgres. There's a whole bunch of you can add new functions, new operators, new server-side languages. We support twelve or 14 different server-side languages in Postgres. So the great thing about Postgres is in 1986, it was designed to be extendable. We carried that code for many years, uh, but effectively now uh, that extendability is a major uh, value. Down here at the bottom, I have a URL to a talk, which goes into more detail about this extendability. So um, why is what makes Postgres extendable? Uh, it has a built-in full text search. It has built-in JSON support. Um, it has uh, data warehouse capabilities, which are native to the system. It also has uh, GIS. Now, GIS is an unusual case. Uh, as you may understand, GIS is pretty complicated. There's a lot of different mapping types and uh, algorithms that are required for GIS. So for Postgres, uh, our GIS system is actually developed by a separate team called the PostGIS team. If you search PostGIS, you'll find us a dedicated website just for the GIS extension to Postgres. That extension is developed independently of the project. They uh, have their own release schedule. And effectively, you take standard Postgres, you download it, you install it. And then you download this GIS extension and you add GIS to Postgres. And all of a sudden you have a, a GIS database and a Postgres database all together. Uh, so that's a great example, I think, of, a, of an external project uh, that is actually a very powerful extension. And down here at the bottom in blue, I have a talk about the many non-relational features of Postgres. Uh, feel free to watch that as well. So what does this actually look like? Well, in a relational system, Postgres still is a relational system. 
Uh, but the difference is that instead of storing only integers and var cars and time stamps, for example, you can put full text search into a column. You can put GIS data into a column. You can put JSON data into a column. In fact, you could potentially put all three data types in the same column, in the same row. Uh, that row can share all three of those data types or and even more of them. Uh, but, and, but the nice thing is that all of this data is, has consistent visibility, has consistent transactions, consistent durability, consistent storage, consistent backup, okay? All of this is basically identical in terms of how the data is stored, how the data is viewed and manipulated. So instead of having all these different data stores, you have a GIS data store, you have a full text search data store, you have a JSON data store all in the same relational store with the same durability, the same management, and so forth. We do have specialized indexing for this. For example, the GI, there's a um, there's the standard B tree and hash indexes for, for things like integer columns, but we have a GI, a GIST index type for uh, GIS data. We have a GIN index type, for example, for JSONB data and full text search data. Uh, so again, you can kind of bring that all together. Um, down here at the bottom is another talk, which uh, explains how our specialized indexing works and why all the indexing options in Postgres. However, let's suppose I've talked to you about Postgres. I've talked to you about all this built-in stuff. What if you need another data store? Okay, what if there are certain data warehouse optimizations that are unavailable uh, in Postgres and you need to use those. Or let's suppose you need some very sophisticated full text search option that's not available uh, and you can't use an extension uh, that we have for, for, for that capability. What if you need to use column or just for unstructured data and you can't use the Citus extension, which is a good extension for column data, but for some reason it doesn't work for you. Or what if you have very high write volume and you need to use sharding uh, but you can't use the sharding that Postgres supports, and you can't produce PG Shardman. Oh, or maybe you just don't want to move all your data to Postgres right now. You want to move some of your data to Postgres and some of your data to maybe um, leave it in its current data store. Well, Postgres has an option for you. Uh, it's called uh, Foreign Data Wrappers. It is part of the SQL standard. Uh, Postgres allows for integration of Postgres data with non-Postgres data. You effectively create a foreign data wrapper. You tell Postgres where to find the data, and Postgres will be able to do inserts, selects, updates, deletes with the foreign data in the same way that it does its local data. Down here in blue, I have a link to a wiki page. It lists over 100 <clears throat> different foreign data wrappers <laughs> that Postgres supports. So they're probably whatever data you're using, we have a way of getting at, at data. So in summary, what I want to kind of say is that Postgres is that relational plus database. It has extensions, uh, which allow you to do specialized things like GIS. And if you're doing statistical analysis, there's a server-side language called PLR, uh, which is uh, similar to uh, SSPI, uh, the statistic package but you can run statistic analysis in Postgres. Um, we have NoSQL type of storage, uh, things like data, uh, NoSQL um, and easy DDL management and sharding in Postgres. We have data warehouse capabilities in Postgres, window functions, data partitioning, bitmap scans, a whole bunch of capabilities there. And then if all three of those don't work for you, in the bottom left, we have foreign data wrappers. So integration with Oracle, integration with Mongo, Twitter, Hadoop, uh, pretty much any data store that you have, we, we have, a, we have a, an option for you. Uh, so I think this kind of puts Postgres in an ideal position to be your central data repository. Uh, this concept was, has been sort of evolving over time uh, as the industry has changed, as requirements have changed. Uh, you start to see different needs for different data stores. Uh, and fortunately, Postgres is in this sort of ideal position where you can effectively integrate all these data stores together in a uniform way with, with a minimum number of downsides. And again, if you can't use Postgres to store your data, 
The foreign data wrapper capability allows you to do that in a sophisticated way. Postgres understands how to push joins and sorts and 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 restrictions to foreign store foreign storage, for example. Uh, so the, the majority of the processing is done in the foreign data wrapper storage, and then it just brings the, the necessary data to the server. So I hope that's been helpful for you. Down here at the bottom is a link to uh, my website and my many presentations. There are 58 presentations on that website, over 100 videos of those presentations, and uh, 650 blog <laughs> entries about Postgres. Uh, so if you would like to learn more, uh, that might be a good place to start. Of course, the slides that you've seen here are also on that website. And with that, I'd like to uh, stop my presentation and start to take some of your questions.